Uh, good evening, my brothers and my sisters. Welcome to our fifth and final Bible study for the month of August uh, 2021. We are indeed grateful to the Lord for uh, this month of study, which has been another power packed month. We focused on one um, book of the Bible this time. Last month, we focused on one chapter of the Bible, uh, namely Matthew 13. This month, we have focused on one book of the Bible, and that is the book of Nehemiah uh, in the Old Testament. And so as we begin today, let's once again pray and ask for the Lord's guidance. And Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace. We thank you for your merciful kindness. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to serve you in this day and age. And we pray, Lord, that you would be honored and glorified in and through the things that are said and done this day. Uh, now, Lord, honor your word, we ask in Christ's name. Amen. I, I begin today by uh, uh, saying that I owe a debt of gratitude to uh, Deacon David Weeks, uh, Deacon Ronald Gilliard, uh, Deaconess Terry Kenley and uh, Minister Maria Newton Tavon, who have come before me this week or this month uh, in, in these lessons. And so they have set the stage for um, uh, this time. They have set the stage for the opportunity uh, for me to uh, finish uh, today. And I'm very, very grateful to them. The book of Nehemiah uh, is one of the history books of the Bible and certainly of the Old Testament. Uh, and it continues the story of Israel's return from the Babylonian captivity and the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Um, as those of you that are students of the Word of God know that the, the Assyrians came first but the Babylonians were more ruthless than the Assyrians in their attack on Jerusalem in that not only did they take the people and articles of silver and gold from the temple, but they destroyed buildings. They destroyed, uh, uh, they, they seek to destroy the land um, um, there. And so when we get to the book of Nehemiah, we found out that um, when, when Nehemiah finds out about this, he, he, he's told um, that the walls are torn down and the gates have been burned with fire. So that there is significant, there is significant trouble in the land of Judah. Um, as Deacon Gilead said last week, uh, Nehemiah has never been to Jerusalem. And then, which makes this even a more special burden that Nehemiah gets. And we, we know that the burden is from God because he wasn't born in Jerusalem. Um, he's never been there, but he knows, in fact, if you go back to chapters 1 and 2, Nehemiah said, it is the home of my ancestors. Some version says, it's the home of my forefathers. Uh, there are some things that our parents have left to us, have given to us, not just our, our biological parents, but the family, the greater family that we are a part of that ought to be of concern to us. Our, our theme for the year continues to be kingdom citizens striving to advance the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Our emphasis for the month of August has been uh, and continues to be a blueprint for kingdom restorations, restoration lessons from the book of Nehemiah. It says the thought for the month has been kingdom citizens must seek guidance and protection from the enemy during the kingdom restoration process. Um, can I just say that whenever you're going through a restoration process, whether it's a physical building or, or life, you will have enemies. They knew or they know that God has given them a blueprint for reestablishing uh, the kingdom and that he will stand with them until the job is done. 
uh, again, another way of saying that is that God has given them a blueprint for securing the city of Jerusalem, and they need to stick with that plan in order to get it done. As we look at the blueprint for rebuilding, we realize um, that our lesson this month, or our lessons this month, have not included all of the specs of the blueprint. Um, there are many more details between chapters 6 that uh, Deacon Gilliard shared from last week um, and chapter 12 that I will be sharing from this week. Uh, you have the opportunity to go back and search all of the specifications for yourself. Uh, we have given you the framework for this book. Also, I want to, uh, you to know, uh, uh, know that Nehemiah, Nehemiah did not work alone. Nehemiah did not work alone. He had another spiritual companion, a man named Ezra. If you read earlier in this chapter, uh, chapter number 12 and in chapter 11, you will see some of the work that Ezra was involved in doing, as well as the book of Ezra, which uh, gives us greater details of the work that Ezra was involved in. As Nehemiah worked hard to rebuild the walls and the gates, Ezra, and this is very important, was working on hard to rebuild the people because walls and gates are uh, no good if we do not uh, know the Lord. For us as a whole, we are in the middle of a, a, a massive building project. Um, our new edifice that includes a brand new sanctuary and an educational um, uh, and office facility. Um, but we've also got to spend much time building the people. Because in the final analysis, if you've got a great building, but you don't have people who are spiritual, then you, you, there's going to be some real weakness um, in there. And of course, uh, it's interesting that we're in the book of Nehemiah in the middle of building the new facility. Um, there, there are so many parallels. We know those that have been involved, those in the, on the building committee, those in the office, those that have worked with the construction crew and and all those kinds of things, the city or whatever else that we need permits from, you know that there's already been opposition. And whenever you're doing a good work or you're doing a God work, there will be opposition. Our words this month are rebuild, rebuild, prepare, protect, and praise. This is lesson 35. And my task this week is simply to help you celebrate God's great victory in all of this. Celebrating God's great victory. Whenever the Lord does something, we need to celebrate. Whenever the Lord does something, we need to celebrate. My brothers and my sisters, if we're not careful, we will focus more on what we don't have than we will on what we have. Said another way, we will focus more on what God didn't do than we will on what God has done and continues to do. I simply want to look at the launching questions here. Question one says, how do you celebrate a great spiritual victory? I just want to say one thing about that. Uh, or maybe two. One is, that there are so many different ways that we can celebrate a great spiritual victory. But may I just remind us, as a people of God, not to, not to, not to minimize our, our, our great victory. I, I look forward to the day that we're going to dedicate the new facility and the celebration um, that we will enjoy at that time. But can I tell you that even though we are celebrating, even though Nehemiah those are celebrating, or they will celebrate, um, or they did celebrate, and we will celebrate, um, the enemy is at the door. Don't think because you're having a good old hallelujah time in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, 
in the name of your Jehovah Jireh, in the name of the Spirit of God who lives in us and works through us, don't think that the enemy is going to just let that slide. He's not going to do it. Uh, every time God tries to do something good or has done something good, the enemy has tried to counterfeit it, what God has done to cause us to not be able to rejoice. But we ought to give God great glory. Number two, how often do you feel the need to rededicate yourself to God? That's a, that's a very good question, a very interesting question in this lesson uh, because it does uh, come up. But how often do you feel that you need to rededicate yourself to the Lord. Uh, some of you, when you were younger or younger Christians, uh, every time you sinned, you felt as if you needed to rededicate yourself to the Lord. I, I want to ask some of the more seasoned saints, some of you that have been walking with the Lord for 30, 40, 50, 60 years, how often do you rededicate yourself to the Lord? You, you might say, well, Pastor Brock, I'm already dedicated to the Lord. Yeah? But rededicate has the idea that I am reaffirming, I am, I'm redoing, I'm coming again and saying, Lord, I want to make sure one more time that you know that I am yours to be used by you and for you. Rededication is very important. And I'm so grateful. I'm glad that we can do rededications at the church house. I'm glad that we can do that revival services at the crusade and the Adventist outreach. But you know, you can do a rededication in your home. It's a matter of you getting before God and expressing your heart to God and saying, Lord, I'm, I'm here and I'm giving myself to you. Number three, do you find the time to pause and thank God when he has given you a victory. And this is important. This is important. Because sometimes, and I've been guilty of this one, sometimes we pray and we pray and we pray and we pray for something, and then God answers. And we get excited about the answer without taking time to thank God for the victory, or for the provision, or for the open door, or for the whatever was bothering you to be gone out of your life. Uh, we forget to take time and say, thank you, Lord. I thank you for what you have done for me. Well, let's read the scripture because I believe that the scripture is very important. Nothing I will say uh, will be as important as what the scriptures say. Nehemiah uh, chapter 12, verses 27 through 31, and I want to also read verse 38. At the dedication, I'm, I'm reading from the NIV version of the Bible. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites uh, were sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully uh, the dedication with songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, harps, and lyres. Um, the musicians also were brought together from the regions around Jerusalem, um, from the villages of the uh, Nephilites, uh, from Beth Gilgal, and from the land of Geba and Abzmavath. For the musicians have built villages for themselves around Jerusalem. When the priests and the Levites had purified themselves ceremonially. They purified the people, the gates, and the wall. Um, I had the leaders, this is Nehemiah speaking, I had the leaders of Judah go up on top of the wall. I also assigned, assigned, assigned two large choirs to give thanks. One was to proceed from the top of the wall on the right toward the dumb gates. And I went to verse 38 because it tells you about the second one. And the second choir proceeded in the opposite direction. Um, I followed them on top of the wall together with half the people past the tower of the ovens of the broad wall. Um, so as we look at the lesson, and I'm not going to read all of it uh, to you because I really want to focus on the verses. There's great commentary here. Please 
uh, go back and read it if you get a chance. But let's look at the, the heads. The first one is the heart of the lesson. Kingdom citizens must know that after the victory, somebody say after the victory, they must celebrate with thanksgiving and rededication. Don't let God give you a victory and you forget him. In this lesson, we conclude our studies from the book of Nehemiah. In our last lesson, we saw God, how God allowed the people to complete the task of finishing the wall. And as Deacon Gilliard said so well in last week's lesson, in 52 days, what a, what a magnificent testimony of how quickly they were able to do this. And, and Nehemiah says uh, back, I think it's in chapter 4, he says we were able to do this because the people had a mind to work. Can I tell you, when God's people have a mind to work, there will be nothing will be impossible for us to accomplish. When we truly act like kingdom citizens, that the king of kings is our king, then there is nothing too hard for us to accomplish. For many people, this would uh, complete the process, but not so with Nehemiah. The blueprint for advancing um, the kingdom must include praise and proper celebration. After the, after the victory had been won, after completing the wall, Nehemiah led the people in a celebration of thanksgiving. He led them in a celebration of thanksgiving to God for what he had done. Uh, you know, sometimes when we build a building, we thank everybody. We thank the contractor. We thank the bank for the loan. We thank the, uh, 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 the people who did the sewage and uh, uh, sewer work. We thank the people who did the electrical work. The air, we're grateful for the air conditioning. When do we thank God? When do we thank God? Make sure that God is the first one that we thank because he is the one who led us to the bank. He's the one who led us to the right contract and the right electricity and the right plumber. Notice Nehemiah uh, never gives himself credit. You know, oftentimes we want to pat on the back. It is God who gets the glory. In our final lesson, uh, we see that the celebration has begun. The people are de dedicating the wall and themselves to the Lord. The choirs, the instruments, the singers, the religious and civic leaders are all gathered for the celebration. Throughout the entire process, Nehemiah exhibited human uh, humility and faith uh, as he led God's people. Now he directs proper celebration. Can I tell you, if, if we as leaders, pastors, deacons, elders, trustees, ministry leaders, uh, whatever you call yourself, apostle, bishop, uh, uh, evangelist, whatever. if we are going to lead God's people, we must begin with faith and humility. Uh, the ministry is not about me. The ministry is not about you. It's about the name of Jesus. And whenever we as spiritual leaders do not point people to Christ, then we have missed the boat. I, I want to share uh, uh, the definition of uh, a blueprint with you. And it may have been shared already this month, but I want to share it with you again if it has. The dictionary says that a, a, a blueprint is a photographic print uh, in point on a blue paper ground or blue on a white paper background used especially for copying maps, mechanical drawings, and architectural Planes. Um, something resembling a blueprint uh, as in serving as a model for providing guidance, especially a detailed plan or program of action for building or constructing. So Nehemiah has a blueprint, uh, a blueprint for kingdom restoration. Let's look at number one. In number one, So kingdom citizens must know that celebrating God's great victories require personal rededication. Verses 27 through 29. 
So, at the dedication of the wall, the Levites uh, of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought from wherever they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication uh, with songs of thanksgiving and with the music, cymbals, uh, harps, and lyre. Now, it's interesting, but Jerusalem has been in ruins for a long time. Even the Levites, the servants in the temple, were no longer, they couldn't find them in Jerusalem. They had to send for them um, uh, to come. There were some nearby, as we'll see a little bit later, but they had to send for the Levites to come to Jerusalem. And this is Jerusalem is a city of David, which is also the city of God. Um, when Christ comes back, he's coming to Jerusalem. He's coming back to, he's going to set up his kingdom. He's going to set up his rule from Jerusalem. But there were no Levites there, or very few nearby. But, but Nehemiah said, God has done a great work in our midst. And because God has done a great work, then we need to celebrate and we need to dedicate. We need to celebrate what God has done and we need to dedicate ourselves to do what God has called us to do. And so they, they came with prepared uh, for a great celebration. They came with the musical instruments. They came with more than just clapping their hands or stomping their feet. They came with cymbals and harps and lyres. Uh, musicians were also brought, verse 28, um, together from the regions around Jerusalem. They got as many of them as they could together. Verse 20, uh, they did this to um, uh, help the people come together. They came from all over. Some of these places of names I can't pronounce, but they said for the musicians had um, built villages for themselves around Jerusalem. That's interesting to me. It was around Jerusalem, not in Jerusalem. Because every time someone came to conquer the land, they came to Jerusalem. They may have been doing this out of fear. I don't know. But what Nehemiah is saying, it's time for y'all to come home. And, and, and of course, he's calling them home um, to, uh, uh, to celebrate the great victory and to personal rededication. Now, I wonder today, my brothers and sisters, do you have anything that you need to celebrate that God has done in your life, in your family, in your home, uh, in your body? Do you have anything you need to celebrate? Is there anything that you need to, is there, are you at a place where you need to rededicate yourself to the Lord? Because you pray and you say, Lord, if you do this for me, I will follow you for the rest of my life. Have you, have you kept that commitment, my brothers and my sisters? Number two, kingdom citizens know that to properly celebrate God's great victory, they must purify themselves. All oh, we into it now. So, verse 20, verse 30. When the priests and Levites had purified themselves ceremonially, they purified the people, the gates, and the wall. Listen to me, my brothers and sisters. Uh, in the text here, in the commentary, the author says that many Christians don't we don't we don't like the word deal with the word purity. Um, we, we think that people when they talk about being pure, that they're trying to say that there's some um, uh, uh, I think the author says goody goody two shoes. Um, we as the people of God are called to be holy. Now we may not be holy, we may not act holy, we may not walk in a manner that represents holiness, but that's who we're called to be. We are not called to be uh, 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 sinners saved by grace. Paul says in the New Testament, we are called to be saints. Now, we don't want anybody to call us a saint because that means that we're going to have to step up the game and start living right. My brothers and sisters, that's what he's calling us to. The word holy and sanctified come from the same root word. They both mean to be pure, to be right, to be righteous. You know, at one time when I was growing up, uh, I saw it more in the, 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 
the holiness church when I was growing up as a child, but, but, but people used to say I'm saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. You don't hear people say that very much anymore. Oh, I'm not sanctified. Well, what are you then? Because if we understand sanctification and being sanctified, we understand that to be sanctified means that I am set apart for the Lord's work. Now, when I am set apart for the Lord's work, that means that there are some places I can't go. I don't care if my friends are going. There are some things I can't do. I don't care how many other people are doing them. There are some things I must do, and I must keep myself from becoming entangled in the world. And so I hear somebody saying now, Pastor Brown, that's a lot to do. And that's what I'm saying to you. Some of us are taking the Christian life too easily. We show up on church on Sunday or once or twice a month or we give a few dollars here and there and we think, oh, I'm, I'm on my way to heaven and I feel good about it. God has called us to live pure lives. God has called us to be holy. God has called us to be sanctified for the master's use. And we, you and I, need to make sure that we are doing that. Listen, listen, the author says here in the text, you do not set aside, your, you do not set your table with dirty dishes. No, you wash them frequently, frequently because you, are, you, want, you want them uh, to be clean. Listen, are you, are you allowing God to wash you often? And, and the way we do that, the way we let God wash us often, is that we confess our sin. But I love this text because it says that they purified themselves ceremonially. They purified the people the gates and the law. In other words, everything that we use in the service of God ought to be sanctified for the Lord Jesus. We should never have anything in the service of the Lord that we don't first dedicate to the Lord for his glory. Every instrument, every utensil, every, every building, every room, Every, every, in fact, we should, we should have, I don't know if we did it or not, but we should have sanctified the outdoor um, uh, open air preaching um, uh, area. Because it is for the Lord. It's, it's holy. In fact, it's interesting to me, being outside, when we were outside um, uh, 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 on the grounds in our cars and walking around, that, 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 that we were, sometimes we didn't act like we were on holy ground, but whenever we're in the presence of the Lord and we are the people of God, we are on holy ground. My brothers and my sisters, have you purified yourself? Have you uh, purified your household? And have you purified the things that God gave you? Have you sanctified? Have you said, Lord, this is your house? And it should be used for your glory. Have you said, Lord, these are your cars? These are your vehicles. I want you to use them for your glory. Have you said, Lord, this is your body that you've entrusted to me. Use it for your glory. And said that they, they, they committed it all to the Lord. Ah, and then he says, and the, the third outline here says, kingdom citizens must know that to properly celebrate God's great victory, they must give thanks. One of the saddest commentaries there is is that the people of God are some of the most ungrateful people you'll ever meet. It's interesting that sometimes when we come to church, all we do is complain. It's too hot in here. It's too cold. The, uh, 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 the sound system is too loud. The song is too long. The preaching, sure enough, is too long. And we go on and on complaining about everything. We have a meal. Oh, the chicken wasn't fried right. The rice wasn't cooked right. I, I can't believe that was macaroni and cheese on my plate. I wasn't sure what it was. We complain about everything. But when God has done something, we ought to take time and do what uh, Nehemiah says here. Nehemiah, it says that Nehemiah had the leaders, it says I, but it means Nehemiah, had the leaders of Judah go up on top of the wall. I also assigned two choirs to give thanks. Uh oh, we run into a problem there. Uh oh. Um, and, and in fact, he says not only did I assign two choirs, he said I assigned two large choirs to, and their purpose was to give thanks. Their purpose was to sing songs of thanksgiving to the Lord. 
their song will get praised. Uh, sometimes in our churches, and I'm not talking about just Jehovah, but sometimes in our churches, the most problems we have in the church is in the choir. It's not the only ones, but we have many problems in our choir. And we've got to get to the point where our choirs understand that we've not come to sing today. We've come to minister before the Lord. He said, I assigned two large choirs to give thanks to the Lord. You can't be angry with half of the people you're singing with and still give thanks to the Lord. And I love it. He said, one choir was coming from one way and the another was coming from another direction. And they were going to meet at some point. Uh, somebody used to sing, a, I heard a song a long time ago where it said, there are going to be singers over there and there are going to be singers over there. And when the singers get together, we're going to enjoy one another. Uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna lay out our lives for the Lord. We're going we're gonna to praise the Lord. Listen, my brothers and my sisters, if you are a singer, remember that one of your primary responsibilities is to give thanks to the Lord. It's to give thanks to the Lord. So when we come together and we, and we see what God has done, we ought to all be rejoicing, but we need somebody to lead us in singing that tells us that look what God has done. That the old folk would say, look where he brought me from. Brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's what God has done. And that's what our singing needs to be about. Nehemiah said, Lord, look what you've done. In 52 days, we've rebuilt the wall. You moved on the heart of a pagan king. And he gave us everything we needed. He gave me letters that gave me passageway. He sent cavalry men and soldiers with me to protect me along the way so I wouldn't be injured. He gave me letters to say to the, the, the keeper of the best forest of lumber to give me whatever lumber I needed for the rebuilding of the wall and the rebuilding of the gate. And when I got here, the people joined me in the work. God, I want to just thank you. I, God, I want to thank you that, that, that when, 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 uh, when, when, my, when Gershom and, and those guys came against me, uh, Sandbell came against me, uh, Lord, Lord, you, you sustained us and you gave us a mind to, to put a bottle of water in one hand and a hammer in another hand, God. But God, you sustained us and I, I want to thank you. And then, Lord, in 52 days, we got it done. Oh, God. It's not because we are great. It's because you are great. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy and the of hell. Whatever God does something in your life, take some time to say thank you and celebrate what God has done. I heard a story recently, I'm going to hold to this, about a young lady that died, who's one of our members who died recently. Her name was Ruthie, Ruthie McClary. And some of you, many of you knew Ruthie, and Ruthie was not one of those people that was up front in the church. But Ruthie was a very faithful member. Ruthie loved being in a, a church school or a Sunday school. Ruthie loved coming to church. She and her brother, uh, and, 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 and she was very, very faithful. She died recently. And one of our deaconess, Deaconess McKinney, shared at a homegoing service that Ruthie was a thankful person. How Ruthie would get up, and she was, now listen now, she was in the hospital. You have, you're not in the hospital, but she was in the hospital, and she would say, Lord, I, I, I thank you for the nurses who are serving me. God, thank you for the person who brought my breakfast this morning, the one who cooked it. Thank you, Lord, for the people who donated the blood I received yesterday uh, uh, so that I can, I can live a few more days. Lord, thank you for the medication and how it's helping me. God, thank you for everything you've done. Listen, you and I take for granted. With all that God has blessed us with, sometimes we are too mean and too mad to take time to give him thanks. But if you want to see a Nehemiah victory in your life, you're going to have to learn to celebrate, and you have to learn to rededicate. God bless you. Have a smile upon you. Father, thank you for this day. and these your people. Now, Lord, help them to hear your word and obey it to the glory of God. Amen.